What if I told you inside Excel, you could fit a complete application, including inventory management, purchasing, invoice, full employee management, complete payroll, customer management, accounting and transactions, vendor management, multi-user sharing and sync, a custom ribbon toolbar, and a full dashboard, all wrapped up into an incredible ERP application. Hi, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers, and this week, we're gonna do just that. In fact, I'm gonna share with you tips, tricks, and techniques how you can create this incredible application in no time at all. It's gonna be an incredible training you just won't wanna miss. I cannot wait, so let's get started. This is probably one of the biggest and best applications I have ever shared on YouTube, and I'm gonna show you how you can make it yourself or customize it. Hi, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers. I am super happy to have you here. This incredible application is an ERP ultimate application. Users, invoices, purchase orders, employees, payroll, customers, vendors, products, transactions, and a whole lot more along with the complete dashboard. And I'm gonna show you how to create this really cool custom toolbar. All right, thanks so much. It's gonna be great if you do like these trainings. I create these each and every Tuesday. Just ask a few things. Just go ahead and click on like, subscribe, and of course that notification icon bell. That'll ensure that you get these each and every Tuesday. This template is absolutely free. Just click the link down below. Look for the word download right under that. You're gonna find a download link. Many ways to support this channel and I really appreciate your continued support. So what's a great way to do that? Patreon's a great way. If you like these templates each and every week, I create an updated template. For example, we had a hourly cost calculator a few weeks ago. This is a great template that allowed us to automatically calculate the actual hourly cost of an employee when we figure in things like benefits, paid time off, and employer paid taxes. Added on top of this, a project. So now our Patreon and of course YouTube Silver members have the ability to now add a project costing into that. So you would select labor, you would select your employee, and the actual hourly cost of that employee is automatically within the budget. And of course, you can add material items too. So this is available to all of our Patreon members. So make sure you join us, Patreon. I'll include the link down below. Not only that, but you get any idea of any features you want to see, I'll put those in as well into these. So please let me know. And that is, of course, on our Patreon platform. Also, YouTube Silver is the same thing. So keep that in mind. All right, we're going to get started. The first thing we're going to do is I'm going to go over a high level overview of everything in this incredible application. Then we're going to get down and I'm going to show you some really special tricks and techniques, how you can create these applications extremely fast. I created this in just a few days. Of course, it takes a little bit long to, to understand the concepts of that. But however, what I'm going to share with you today is going to allow you to build these types of applications extremely rapidly because there's a lot of similarities within the uh, types of databases here. And you'll each one of them, customer, vendor management, products, employees, there's so many similarities and so understanding those and bringing those into your applications you're going to be able to develop them extremely rapidly and of course there's some great uniformity and of course also this is sharing in sync and that means that this type of application can be shared in sync among users now this payroll application i created a payroll for this i've got a specific video just on this payroll so i added that in here we don't need to spend too much time on this there's not too many changes if you do want to learn how to create this payroll i have an exclusive video just on that in youtube just search my youtube channel for payroll and you'll be able to find that so we have an admin section here in this where admin's going to run all we have a shared folder employee picture folder product picture folder and user picture folder. So those are great for the picture folders. And admin keeps track of everything. We can turn on and off sharing and sync. It's a feature that can be turning off. Now sharing and sync, again, I have exclusive videos just on sharing and sync. It allows you to take your application and share and sync among anyone in the world. The idea is relatively simple. Each individual user has their own template, their own unique template, and only the data is shared between users using a shared folder such as Dropbox, Google Drive, or the Microsoft OneDrive. So some really great options on that. The, a lot of these have to do with payroll 
and we also have transactions so you're going to be able to add transactions into there if you want to add a new transaction you can simply add brand new transactions if you want to edit any existing transaction you can do so here so you'll see some similarities whether it is transactions or whether it is vendors right so there's so many similarities in here and you can simply duplicate the code and then modify it and we're going to show you exactly how to do that so whether it's employees payroll customers vendors they're all very very similar each one of them does have a search so if you want to search for any particular vendor or anything like that you can do that from here if you'd like to search each individual a database that has a search view and if you want to search for an individual vendor all you would have to do is just type that in here or search for any record and it's automatically going to come up and clear the filter so each one of those database sort of lists whatever you want to call them customers vendors very similar each one of them has a shift so once you develop a single table with the code you just have to duplicate it and then make the update so we're going to go over that so it's very very simple we have an incredible dashboard here we have also some great slices of what we can do we're going to be adding in those and we also have a really really cool product database so we can add update and edit products here and of course we have our purchasing now invoicing really cool invoicing our invoicing and our purchase orders contain the same screen so all we have is if we have a list of invoices and we have a tab control for our purchases so if we want to select on purchases we would select on a purchase and load it here the most recent purchases or invoices will appear up at the top creating brand new purchase orders or invoices is relatively easy all we would need to do is just click new and then we'd enter a customer if it's an invoice we'd enter that customer here or if it's and just add in your products here whatever they might be and they're going to automate we've got great invoicing so the idea in this video is not to show you every single line of code but basically how you can build these applications extremely fast so we're going to show you that and of course how we can combine them to create incredible share and sync applications once you have these in app applications you can then use them in your business you can sell these applications or you can of course create them for your customers as a freelance work so some really great ways to do that we're going to go over all of that all right so what we're going to do is we're going to start out we're going to go for some uniformity principles and what that means is how how can we develop large applications with a lot of data very very fast and that's through streamlining a process and i'm going to go over that with you now there's all of our records all of our records have relatively the same thing so inside our sheets we have multiple sheets we have orders right so here is our orders so we're going to go all the way I've got an admin screen which you saw a dashboard which brings everything together chart data which is simply a combination which helps us build the dashboard and that would be hidden our orders which you've already seen we can again because purchase orders and invoice orders are so similar we can use the same screen and then we have this tab design that will either load all the recent purchase orders or load all the invoice orders we've got a paid amount for either one and of course we can change the status on those as well and of course we have an order list which is simply a list of orders now this type of sheet would probably be hidden you don't need to have your end users see this but this is where all of our orders are tracked and of course more importantly we have an order type we need to differentiate between the type of order we have a purchase order or an invoice order so when we're loading those orders whether it's an invoice order or whether we're loading the purchase orders we want to make sure that we differentiate it so all we need is a simple filter to do that our order items are the individual orders notice we have on a, on a particular purchase order we have items that make up that let me select this we have individual items that make up this purchase order or whether it's an invoice order and those order items are stored on this sheet called order items so this is a great way to to store those and so basically our orders are made up of those three there's two databases one to store our main information so if we have a, a main information we can select main information which is our purchase order or invoice order the date and the status and the vendor or customer name notice that this is going to change if it is a if it's an invoice type it's going to be customer otherwise it's vendor so we can use some dynamic content to change that very very helpful so when we have like similar like a like purchase orders or an invoice we can combine them into a single order screen and then simply call it order management that runs both of them so inside our order items we also just simply need to keep track of the individual order id 
the type, whether it's a purchase or an invoice. So these are the individual items that make up a purchase order or an invoice. The ID of the product, each individual product has its own ID. So if we look into the products, we see that each product has an ID. We have a UPC, a product name, a description, picture, purchase, sales price, and in stock. And also what we want to have inside the item list. If we go down here, we want to know the quantity. So back inside the order items got so many here we also have the quantity the price now this the price could be if it's a purchase we want our the purchase price and if it's an invoice it would be the sales price so very very simple and then the total the item row now this is the row the item row that it lands on inside the order so once we're on the order we need to know what row is it row 11 12 or 13 we need to keep track of the row that it's placed on and so we would keep track of that inside our order items and then the database row this is by using a formula so that we know that the row that the database sits and if you see how i'm scrolling here and the header is consistent and that is because i've frozen the top row so all we would need to do is just select on row four and then we go to the page layout and we want to excuse me we want to go into the view and we want to make sure that we're freezing we can unfreeze them if we unfreeze them or we can then freeze them and that's going to freeze them so we can lock that in kind of a helpful way Okay, great. So that's basically our orders, kind of a summary of our orders. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get into the databases. And then we have multiple databases. We have vendors, right? We can, we can locate it from the sheet or we can go directly from here. We have customers, we have products, we have users, and we have employees. Now, notice that all of them are basically the same design on the sheet. They all have very similar letters. They all have a search. They all have the headers. Now, when you're designing these, the idea is this. We want a single sheet that the user is allowed to interact with, such as this, employee management. This is not our original data. Now, we want the original data on an employee database, such as this. This data, this sheet would be hidden so that the user doesn't have actually have access to this. We want to give the users access to this. This way they can search and filter, they can add new, they can edit, and they can do whatever they want from this. If we want to, again, you saw the search, it's very, very simple. If we want to search for an employee, we just do MAR mark here, and then we can simply easily, very easily clear the filter as well. So the filter works great. So what we want to do when we separate the actual database, from the user sheet, it gives us a lot of opportunity to edit and update. When I want to edit any type of record, whether it's employee, a product, or transaction, customers, vendors, all we need to use is this single group. We're going to call this edit group. It's a set. There's combined two shapes on this. So for this particular one, I want to click on the edit. And then what we see is we can then use a user form. Now I get a lot of comments that saying, Randy, how come you don't see more user forms? And often we love to use sheet forms, but in this particular instance, when you want to do rapid development like this, you know, there's the user forms are not necessarily beautiful, but they're very easy to work with. And we can do a lot with them. We can duplicate them very easily. And I'm going to show you how to do that as well. So notice that there's similarity between the user forms. This particular user form looks very, very similar to the customer user form. So duplicating is very, very easy. And I'm going to show you how we can do that as well. So we've got that. So basically all we need to do is make a selection change, edit. If we want to delete a record, again, all we would do is just click delete. And we, if we want to delete it, we would just click yes. In this case, we'll do no. We want to add a brand new record, whether it's a customer vendor, we can do this simply within the user form. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to drill down into this to see how we're able to develop these very, very fast applications mm -hmm. using these types of sheets with that. And so keep in mind that each individual sheet has their own employees, has their own employee database. We have transactions, which have their own transaction database. This is where the actual data is stored. This type of thing should be hidden, products, and then our product database. So notice there's very similarities. Now let's take one of these, let's pull inside our transactions here. Let's take this a little bit of a part. I'm going to uh, go through and view uh, columns A and B. Now these would generally be hidden and we have really three different types of admin fields. One is the selected row. So we see that we have a row that's selected and then that's gonna change on selection change event. It is VBA that's gonna change that. 
we've got conditional formatting that's going to color. If I highlight this and we go into the home and we go into conditional formatting and we manage rules, we see that we have three different rules. Now, B3, now this is exactly the same for every sheet, which makes it really handy. B3, if B3 equals the selected row, we want to give it this dark color. Basically, it's just two, a dark background color here. If we go into the fill and fill effects, we see we've got two dark color blues. And also we have the font. The font is bold and it is a white color. That is going to be the conditional formatting. So that means that all we have to do is have VBA change this row. If our VBA notice that changing this row automatically selects it. Also, in each instance, notice that there's an original database. So, for example, transactions here. If you take a look, you see I've says lunch with Fred here, meals and expense. If I take a look inside the transaction database and I take a look at row seven of the database, that is the same record, transaction ID four, lunch with Fred. Notice inside this database here, we have a row number. What we can do is when we bring this data over, I also want to bring in this row number. And that means when the user makes a selection change on this, I want to do a few things. One is I want to take whatever row is selected, I want to put here. Two, whatever database row is, I want to put it here. Now, how do we know the database row? You don't see it here. That database row is actually located in column K. However, it is hidden. It's hidden using a custom format. If I select on the individual cell, we see it's seven. However, it is not visible. How can we do that? Well, the best way to do it is use a conditional formatting. We can change the background color the same as the font color. That's one way to do it. But here we're using a custom background using a picture. So we want to use a custom format. So if I go to more number formats and we use a custom format, three semicolons, two, if there's words or text involved, we'll use three. If it's only numbers, we will use two. I've used three. So if I change that to general and I click OK, we see now that the rows actually show up. So knowing that I've got the database row seven, I want to take this and I want to put it directly inside B4. Okay, so once I have that now, if I decide to edit this transaction, I want to pull up all the original data. Since I know the original database row, all I need to do is go into the original sheet here, look at seven, and then just run a loop and pull all this information into the user form and we can do that as well through a very easy loop and i'm going to show you how to do that so it's very very easy for us to do that and bring it up because i know the database rule so that's why when we run our a special filter that's going to check for any filter here and it's going to bring all the data inside here so if i want to know only things that contain s right and so here we have only items that contain s or whatever s a so that is going to bring it up. So it's going to run that advanced filter. So notice we have maybe we want to know all the salaries here. So we can do that. And so what it's going to do is going to bring it, but the database rows are going to stay consistent. And so what we need to do is run an advanced filter to bring all of this information. Now, either it's going to have nothing, meaning there's no filter, it's going to bring everything over. Or if the user has specified some text located in F2, we're going to use that. And so what we're going to do, the best way to do that is to, again, run that advanced filter. So if we take a look inside our original data, we see we've got some criteria which we're going to be running. Here's the original data here. Here is our criteria. I want to ensure two things. One, I want to make sure that we have a transaction name. And that is important because if a record does get deleted, if we delete it, what we're going to do is we're going to keep maintain the number, but we're going to delete everything else. So that means anything that got deleted will not come through our advanced filter. So this, so we're checking to make sure the transaction name is not blank simply by putting the less than or greater than. Next up, I want to link this directly to the cell that they've added. So we can use equals, we're going to use an asterisk, which is the wildcard and transactions F2 and wildcard so what that's going to do is going to duplicate whatever the user has entered directly inside f2 here then what we're going to do is we're going to run that advanced filter all the way from the last row this is our advanced filter these are our criteria we're going to check to make sure the transaction name is not blank and we're going to make sure that the transaction name contains salary if it does contains because we have asterisks on each side it doesn't have to match i want those results to come directly inside here 
Once I get all the results, I'm gonna check for the last row. In this case, the last row is 12. If we have a last row that's less than three, that means we have no data. Then I'm gonna bring all this data over and I'm gonna bring it directly into the database and bring it, bring it directly into the list here. And that's how we're gonna do it. So when a user makes a selection, so that's a great way. And we've repeated this process for every single list, for every single database we have, regardless of it, is the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into it and show exactly how we did it and how we can duplicate that very, very easily and then make changes for that. Okay, so let's take transactions and let's step into this one and see exactly how we can make this type of sheet function and how we can get it to work and how you can use this with any database data type that you have. So the first thing you want to do is create two sheets. The first one is going to be our list, and that's the one that users will have access to. Next up is where your database is located. Make sure what I'm doing is I'm starting it on the third row, and I'm also using making sure that we have information for criteria and our results. So in your database, make sure we understand we're going to start up with the third row to make things easier two rows for our title and then your data can start now you don't need to use the conditional formatting and you want to make sure that the last column of your data contains row now each one as we add new ones we will be adding this formula row and this is important if for some reason you're going to be deleting rows that way we always have an updated row number so it's very important that in your data you do have the last column available for the row you'll want to skip a few columns and that way if you can easily add one then we're going to add our criteria now i'm using criteria i'm using two criteria both for the transaction name i want to make sure it's not blank and then we want this particular one as using a link tied to whatever the user is going to be entering filters so if you want to do that all we would need to do let's just clear that out and show it again so all we would need to do is just type in equals and then your quotation mark and then your asterisk and then the and sign and then we want to click on the link it to the cell in which the user is going to be entered then we're going to type in another and sign then we want another asterisk and the reason we're adding the wild cards before and after is because i want the user search to contain anything the user now if we want an exact match we will not be adding the asterisk before or after if we want it to start with that we would only add the asterisk after so those are the wild cards okay so then through our vba which we're going to use this criteria and we want the result to come here now when you're creating your own database it's very very important to make sure that the header names here are matching the header names here so what i always do is i just copy them so i copy them using Control c and then we're just going to paste or paste values or either one these header names are critical and then i'm going to do exactly the same thing i'm going to copy this one and then i'm just going to move a few columns over and i'm going to paste this here so once we do that right that ensures that our column header names are always a match and that's very very important because anything else will create bugs in our code so we want to make sure that they're automatically exactly identical okay so that we have our transactions here our results are here and we can use the top row for that now great so let's take a look inside this code and see what we would do if the code was not present and we have another sheet now of course you're going to download my template if you like my template right you can download it for free but if you want to support the channel i've got 300 of my best templates all for one very low price available down below in the links down below so you can pick up 300 and of course that comes with a zip file and of course library so you can easily find and locate whatever training you want and also single click to open it and a single click to go to the youtube training so i made it really easy and that's the 300 workbook file all right so what we're going to do is we're going to get into the code and i'm going to drill down on this sheet and we're going to show you exactly how quickly and easily you can create that now to keep in mind what you would want to do let's say you're creating this you want to copy this shape here now once you copy this from what we want to do is we want to clear out the macros so what these are is basically if i were to zoom in in here and take a look basically it's just two it's a background here and an icon so it's just very very simple so that's all we have to do so maybe just two backgrounds a background here just a square background along with an icon same thing there so very very easily 
we can create those shapes and we've tied macros to those shapes and I'll be getting to those in just a moment but we're going to go step by step so that you can understand how you can easily duplicate this process inside your own workbook to create really amazing workbooks and applications in very very little time okay so what we're going to do is we're going to go into the VBA you can go into the developer if you don't have the developer you can find it here just go into the options and then what you'll want to do is you'll go to the customize the ribbon and you want to make sure the developer is selected you can also use a shortcut to get in there alt f11 is the shortcut and that's going to get you right into this okay so we've got a lot of sheets and a lot of code on this but don't worry i'm going to walk you step by step in fact because of the similarities we don't need to go over everything because it would just be repeating and that's the beauty of an application like this is because once we understand the principles we can duplicate those principles to create create any size of an application in very little time so what we were on is we have so we have some code that's inside the sheet now this is if we take a look here's our sheets here and I've got one called transactions I've got just a little bit of code inside our transactions then what we do is we have a module of transactions and we've got some there so it's very very easy so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just let's try this let's see how it works I'm going to delete this I'm going to delete all the code here and I'm going to so nothing's going to work and I'm going to go into the transaction database and I'm going to delete the code here so now let's assume you have my workbook and you want to make it your own okay so nothing's going to work it's going to create a bug nothing notice the selection change nothing's happening because I've deleted all the macros so you know if I click here it's not going to find the macro the macro is no longer there because of course we deleted it but that's fine and that's exactly what I want to do because I want to show you how quickly you can do this yourself and we can use copy and paste and then replace to make it very very quickly so let's say you grab my workbook and you have my code in there but you want to customize it for your workbook so let's go into let's say the product macros so we have all the product macros so whatever whatever sheet you have of mine you're going to do control a copy it and then control c so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this inside and replace it control V now obviously this code is customized for our product sheet so it will not work on our transaction sheet right so what we have to do is we have to customize it for that so what we need to do is we need to use find and replace to change it notice this one has product sheets and we also have something called products database so this is specifically for our product so notice products database so what I want to do is I want to then change it so for the first thing what we want to do is we want to change the sheet name so I'm going to look anywhere that says let's change the sheet name so I'm going to use control F and we notice here's the find and we're going to click on replace so I'm going to change products with what if we take a look inside our transactions what is the sheet name we're using the sheet code name is called transactions so the first thing we want to do is use transactions and then period okay well, let's cancel that and do that one more time just so we can set it up okay so once we have that let's do products here and we can just select it because it was it's already here replacing that and then bringing that up here it always moves print with transactions okay trend to make sure we get the spelling right and then we'll just do current module make sure you're on the current module not the current project okay so current module and then just click replace all okay all right so it's been 11 so we have that so we see that and actually I did transactions should be transactions so we've got to update that one more time transactions and replace all so that's the sheet name once we have that now we want to replace the database notice that it says we still have product we've got a lot of few to change next up notice the products sheet here so we have one that's called product database product database I want to change that out so I'm going to copy that put that directly in here and I also want to change that to the transaction so I'm going to look on the sheet here and we see that we have one called trans DB trans DB so we're going to replace it our database sheet needs to be trans DB and then period so we're going to replace all of those okay and clicking okay all right very good now what I want to do is I want to replace some of the names just the general the names so we're going to do transactions and this is exactly how I replace it and we're going to replace that that's what I want so I'm going to look for products and replace it with transactions so these are good for the names products and replace it with transactions you always start with the longest names first the longest notice we started with the sheet names and then we go down to the smaller names so we're going to use replace all okay so one replacement that's fine now what we want to have is I want to use the smaller name so anything if we take a look inside we see product row product column so what I want to do is a shorter name so here we're going to do product 
and we're going to do trans okay so we're going to do replace all okay 73 replacements so we see that it's much quicker okay very very good now let's take a quick look now we see that this here we don't have to change much transaction form this is not correct so we do need to make it what is the name of the form the name of the form that we're going to use for it whether we're editing or new it's called transact form transact form so we do need to update that and so what i'm going to do is i'm just simply going to take a look at this wherever this is found and i'm going to replace it with the correct one so going to replace it here and it's called trans if we take a look at that act farm so now we can replace all the form names because we're going to need that and that's five also our macros i want to make sure that those start with the correct macros if we take a look we want to know what is the macro name we see that the macro name is called transaction add new so we want to make sure that all of them start with transaction and then the underscore so that's critical so we have that so i'm going to again control f which is going to do i'm going to replace that i'm going to look for transaction so transaction and then underscore transaction and that is the beginning of each of our macros transaction underscore and we're going to replace all of those now we're getting almost close to completion so very very quick so anywhere we see this transact we want to make sure we replace that with also transaction anywhere that might be there because that's replace all so we get and then that's 12 replacement okay whoops let's do this was a space here and that's so i'm going to undo that right notice that there's no i want to do a space so we're going to do control z and notice this has a space so i'm going to remove that space and then that's correct so i want to replace it now we're going to replace all and we see that we now have the space there okay very good things are looking very good we've got our macros already set notice our variables are already automatically updated and we just have to go through and double check so we see transaction there's no picture so we don't need this macro because products contain a picture but transactions do not so we can simply remove that we will be editing selecting a transaction to edit so we can do that now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at that form we want to make sure that the form that we created when you want to create a form we won't create a form today because it's a little bit long but it's a very basic form inside each individual forms when you do create this we create simple fields but the important part of this in order to limit the code and limit the time that you create these is to make sure that you name your fields with uniformity okay and that means basically the first field should be called field one second field field two field three regardless if it is a type of field drop down list a combo box in this case field four field five and field six okay you also want to set the tab orders tab order the first one can start at tab order zero so it's called tab index then one here you see this is that means just the order when you tab through them two three and then all the way to four and then the save would be five and then this would be six so that way we can tab through them so it's very easy i've added a background onto each one of these it's the same background it can be a jpeg image so when we select on the form and we go to images here we go to picture right here this bitmap we select it and we can select any image i have a form background make sure it is a jpeg right not png so i've got that and we can open that and that's just this form background this blue form background i'll make sure to include those pictures all the icons and all the pictures associated with this training inside our for our patreon members so all the resources for every single training comes on patreon so we see the most important thing is these fields now we see that we have these several fields one two and all the way through the last one field and we're going to take a look all the way to field six we're going to take a look inside the database we want to know inside this database what is the last column so the last column is actually not including the column for the row equals column i want to know the last column here and that column is column seven so what i want to do when i'm saving this i know i want to create a loop from two our new records if we have a brand new record we're going to add the id and we're going to add the formula that's going to be the row if we're either saving or updating whether it's an existing record or new we're going to loop from two to seven and we're going to save whatever information is in that user form from two to seven and i'll show you why that's column two to column seven so we're going to either update whatever's in the user form here all the way to here when we want to edit the information it's going to load the information so we're going to load from two three four five six seven whatever's inside the database we're going to load it inside of that user form so to do that we need to know how many columns and that's what we're going to do right now so when we go back into that macro here 
and we're going to edit an existing transaction. We need to make sure this is already seven, and the reason is the product, so we already have two to seven. Perfect, so, but however, what we want to do is, this is seven, which is sit, column seven, but the fields, notice that the fields on that only go to six, right? If we remember here, it starts out at one here, field one, and it goes to field six which is fine. Our notes go in column seven, but field six. Let's just take a quick look at that. Our notes here go in column seven, but field six. So we can keep that in mind. So when we know that, we're going to create just a little bit of a loop that's going to help us save or load the information from the database into these fields, or whether we're saving it. If we're saving it, we're going to take whatever's inside these fields and we're going to load them into the database. So when we have an edit, so for this particular macro, let's go ahead and pull the macro up here. So for this macro here, we're going to select on a transaction to edit if before is empty. And that means when they click edit, that means that little edit icon when they made a selection. Now we have a, this, this edit icon. When they make a selection on that, that is what's going to happen. I want to look and determine what row is like i want to make sure that there's a database in b4 this is the row the row of the original database if we go into the transactions here and we see the row 21 we know that this is on row 21 or whatever row it's on important so what we need to do is if we're going to load it we must have a row so we're going to check inside b4 if it's empty that means we don't have a row to edit if we do we're going to take that row we're going to put it in this variable notice it's already been updated we're going to focus on the transaction form make sure that we have the right form if we add a period next to that we see that our intellisense comes up and then so we see so we know we've got the right form name there two to seven now the transaction field remember the transaction fields go from one to six one to six on the field names so that's why we're going to start transaction column column two minus one is one our first field starts at one and goes to six so this data mapping is going to help meaning we start on column two however transaction name is field one transaction form transaction name is field number one so that's why we have to subtract one because i want the field name very important on that so now that we know that this particular loop here we're going to determine the row we're going to set the transaction field to the controls. That means one of the field controls of our user form. This is the name field one, field two, all the way through six. So we're setting that transaction to whatever field. All we need to do when we edit is we need to take whatever's inside our transaction database, making sure that we have the correct name. If we add again, add the period, we see that IntelliSense shows up. So we have the right name, the transaction row, the transaction column. It's going to take that data and it's gonna add it into the field. So basically we are looping from two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We're taking whatever's information in the row and we're adding it into the user form here. The last thing is we're gonna display the user form. Perfect. Then all we need to do is tie this particular macro to the edit icon. So when I select on here, that edit icon is going to do that. So when I select on here, notice it's, it already works, you see, because we'd previously tied it to that. Now, if it's a little bit hard and you're not sure how to tie a macro to this, we're going to click on the selection chain, selection panel, because we have them grouped and they're kind of small. So here we have the edit group here, edit icon and edit background. We have the delete icon and delete background, but I may want to tie a macro to this. So I'm just going to use the selection pane to hold down my control and select both of them. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to click assign macro. And then all I need to do is just go down here, look for a transaction here and then edit and then select it. And that's all I need to do. And I would do this same for the delete. Okay. Very, very good. So we see that we, the editing is now working. We can skip down transaction, save or update again, please make sure to add a transaction, everything and making sure that there's a value in field one. When the, when the form is open, we need to make sure there's a value. If I need to determine, now regardless of the type, so keep that in mind, that regardless of the list, everything's always in the same, meaning when we have an employee, it's right, if we take a look over, I'm also using exactly the same three cells. When I have in my customers, I'm using the exact thing, the selected row, the customer database row, and of course, we have the next customer ID, which we haven't gotten to yet. So it's the same thing, right? So the next, in this case, it's next transaction ID, which we'll get to in just a moment. 
as we moved it. But the first thing what I want to do is when I'm saving it, so now the macro that we're tying to this is called saver update. It is the same macro whether we are saving a new transaction or whether we are uh, updating an existing transaction. So it's exactly the same macro and that makes things very easy. We need to make sure that with that form, that transaction form, we want to make sure that they've entered something in that. If they try to uh, save, right, let's take, if they decide to add a new transaction and they save it, we need to let them know, oops, variable transaction database. Okay, so transaction, that should be, so notice that the database we did was incorrect. It's trans database. So I'm just going to use control F Instead of transaction database, I'm going to replace it to trans database. So that's fine. So notice it didn't recognize that. We didn't get the sheet. Replace all. Very, very simple. Just two replacements. Very good. So now what we're going to do is I want to make sure that we get this message. When I try to save it, some, if transaction name has not been entered, please make sure to add a transaction name before saving. And that is because our first field, field one right here, is empty so that's what we're checking on the first i'm checking if field value is empty please make sure to add a transaction before saving transactions our sheet b4 equals empty if b4 when i click add a new transaction i am going to automatically select it. and i'll show you now let's get that selection change while we're at it i want to make sure notice that we deleted the code nothing's going to happen here so let's do that now because we create some uniformity all we need to do is just take on any other sheet copy what we have there go back into the transaction you can copy mine once you download it and then just paste it right in here okay so we do need to make a few things right if there's a change for filtering filter i want to double check that that's the right row f2 is correct so here in transaction if there's a change what are we going to do we are going to not going to be vendor refresh i'm going to i think it's transaction refresh transaction but what i'm going to do is i'm going to use lowercase and if if the t goes to capitals i know i've got the right macro name and it did right if for some reason it's wrong right notice it stays there so that's a great way of seeing if you've got the right macro name so transaction refresh so notice that all i had to do was replace this transaction refresh and that's the macro that's going to refresh the list okay great so that works now on selection change notice the edit group it's the same name regardless of whatever sheet if, for example let's go into the customers here this set of shape is always called edit group regardless of the sheet that you're on i give the name of the same and that means i don't have to change the code it's always the same the only thing that i have to change is the column this appears in column l this edit group however inside our transactions here what column are we going to place it? this is going to be column k i want it to appear in column k so i need to make sure that we're going to update that for column k so let's go so if for some reason the edit group is visible i'm going to hide it with this line so that's the first thing and that's going to all happen on selection change if the user makes a selection change of a lot of cells we're going to exit this up again if the group is visible we're going to hide it if the user makes change from d4 through k now i do need to update that so we're on transactions they're going to make a selection all the way through j right k they're not going to be selecting so we're going to change this to j then also we want and we want to make sure that d contains a value which is correct which is our transaction id so that is good that means if they select something else nothing's going to happen so now we want that edit group to appear in the last column beyond one column beyond the last one which is column K. So all I need to do is change this to K here. And then what I want to do is change this to K. Now, what are those? First thing is I want to know the selected row when the user makes a selection change. Whatever row that they've selected, we're going to put that in cell B3, regardless of the sheet. That is our selected row. B4 is going to take on what? Where is that database row? That's located in column K. So we do need to update that. We see that database row, set the database row, and that's going to go in B4. Now with the edit group, always the same name, I'm going to place that in column K. That's all we need to do. That's all the edit we need to do. And now when we select it, we see we've got everything working. And of course, we would hide this, and I'll show you that in a bit. But we'll keep it open. So now everything's working perfectly. Notice with just a little bit of edit, so we don't need to make any other changes to this worksheet code. We were focused here on the transaction. So let's go back into the transactions here. So save and update is where we were. Now, what we want to do is we want to differentiate. We know we've got a value here. We want to differentiate. So B4, now we understand how B4 contains a value. 
But if I click add new, one of the few th first things that I do inside the macro is I clear out B4. Notice there's no database row. There's also no selected row. So that's going to let the VBA know that this must be a new transaction because there is nothing in B4. As soon as I select on something, B4 becomes populated. So if B4 equals empty, we know it's a new transaction. Now, again, this is for any type of database. I'm using the same exact three fields. So the first thing what I want to do inside is I know it's a new transaction. So I want to go into the transaction database and I want to get the first available row. So let's take a look inside the transaction database. Regardless of the database, we want that first available row, 88 in this case. So what I want to do is I want to put that in a variable called transaction row, and that's our first available row. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the next transaction ID. So to do that, what we need is a named range for our transaction IDs. So when we go into the formulas, let's exit out of here, and I want to go into the name manager. Oops, we need to, we got some component open. Let's just escape out of there. Okay, so now what we want to do is go into the formulas and name manager. And we also want to look inside our transaction ID. So we created a name using our offset. And that's a dynamic named range. So when I tab there, we see if we zoom in transaction database, we're starting on the header row. That's important because if there's no data, it could create an error. So I always want to start on the header row, which is row three. And I want to go one row down, offset one row down. That's our starting position. We're not going to move any columns over. And I want to determine the number of rows to count. We're going to use count A. Once again, we're also going to start on our header row. We're going to go up to a large number. But of course, we don't want to actually include that header row. So we're going to use minus one. And we just want a single column. So if we tab, using the tab keys into that, we see that this encompasses all of our data, the dancing ants around it. So since they are all numbers, and I want to determine the next available row, the next available ID, how do I do that? Inside the transactions, what I can use is use the max function here with the transaction id so this of course is going to result if i highlight over here that is going to result in 84 as we can see plus one is going to be 85 and if there's no data it will create an error therefore we've wrapped it in if error and we're going to default it to one meaning that would be the first id number okay great so we see that that's going to be so what i want to do is i want to take that and I want to put it in the first available row. So A in the transaction row is going to take, take on B5. That is the next transaction ID into transactions B5. So that's all we need to do. Just take whatever that next available and put it directly in A. Also in column eight, I want a special formula. This was actually only for products. This, so in other words, products had a special formula. That's where we copied it from. Products, I have a special formula for our in stock here. And I want to make sure that that one's, let's see, I think we got it on the new ones here. Oh, that's our here inside our database. So products had a special, form, which we don't need. So notice there's a special formula inside our in stock. And basically this formula is going to determine the number of products purchased minus the number of sold. So I don't need that formula inside. So we can remove that. And I also don't need the value on hand. This was specifically for products. So we can remove that. But we do need the row. We just need to double check inside our transaction database exactly which column our formula is going to go to determine the row. That's going to go into column H. So H is where we want to put that. So for new records, all we want to do is two things. Take on that brand new ID and put that into column A and take the formula and put it into H. If it's an existing transaction, we don't need to do these two things because they're already there. All I need to do is get the existing row from before. This is the transaction row. Then again, we're doing another loop, this time from two to seven, just as we have before. But this time, instead of putting the information into the controls, we are taking it from the controls and we're putting it into the selected database right here. Transaction row, transaction call. But first, what we're going to do is we're going to set that component here, the transaction field. We're going to set it based on the field and the transaction column minus one. In other words, it's going to start with one and go all the way to six. What we do then is we take whatever's inside this field, inside our user form, and we place it directly inside our database here based on the transaction row and based on the rotating transaction column from two 
to seven. That's all. And we just have to unload the form, which is going to clear and hide the form. Okay, the updated list of transaction names, we don't necessarily need that. That was only for products, so we can remove that, no reason. We also have a macro that's going to run our transaction refresh list. That's the next macro, and that simply refreshes the list. Okay, very good. So we understand that. Let's take a look and see how that will work. The next macro, transaction clear filter, is basically designed to run to clear the filter. So all we need to do is select this button. It is this button. If we select on any individual component inside this, and we click assign macro, we see that transaction clear filter has been assigned to that now we have a change event and when we make a change to f2 something is going to run now we briefly covered it i'm going to take another look at it with you inside our sheet here transaction sheets worksheet change event when we make a change to f2 we want something to run transaction refresh list this is the exact same macro that we just saw here and it's also the same macro that's going to run when we save our updated transaction now the good thing is that we don't have to run it when we clear the filter we're going to clear the, the merge cell f2 through h2 let's double check on that F2, it's actually G2, right? It doesn't cover H. So I'm gonna update that F2 to G2. So let's make the change here, G2. So when we run that, it's automatically going to trigger this macro right here because any change on F2 is gonna trigger that right here. Any change on F2 will trigger the refresh. So even when we clear the contents with another macro, it's going to work. So if I select this, it's going to clear the macro and it's going to run that. Will it return no data? I guess we certainly gonna have to make some updates to this refresh list. Remember, we haven't been over this yet. We do need to make updates. The first thing we're going to do, transaction D4 through M4. Let's make sure that that is correct. We don't need to go all the way through column M. We only need to go through column K if we see that. So we need to change this to K. Okay, very good. The last row is going to be based on A, based on the transaction database. That's all correct. Now let's take a look at our advanced filter. We will have to make some updates for that to get that working. So we're going to go into the transaction database. We can close this. We see that our original data is going to go to column H. So we're going to make that update, column H. Now, what about our criteria? Our criteria is M2 through N3. That doesn't necessarily need to change. That looks good. However, our results need to be corrected. If we take a look, remember we copied this from the product, so we do need to make those updates. Our results are going to come Q2 through X, all the way Q2 through X. So let's make that update here. Q2, changing that here, and then through X. We also need to determine the last results row. We can use column Q for that. I wanted to determine the last results row and using control, shift, and down arrow, we can see the last one is 86. So we're gonna use column Q to determine that inside the code. So going back here, that last, we're gonna change this, the last results row, changing this to Q. Okay, so now what we'd like to do, we're gonna turn off, if the last results row is less than three, we're gonna turn back on application screen updating and we're gonna exit the sub, meaning that we have no results. And what I'd like to do is I would like to also sort these. Now, what do I wanna sort them on? We'll sort them based on the transaction ID to make sure that they are sorted. And that transaction ID is located in Q, column Q. So we're gonna focus on the sort. If there's only one row of data, meaning the last row is less than four, there's no need to sort because we only have one row. We can skip it and we can go to no sort right here. However, if we have more than one row, we can continue on with the sort. So we're gonna focus on Q, which is our ID. So that's what's gonna be, and I want it ascending. Our range, we're gonna update that range. Gonna make that to from Q all the way through X. Very good. Now what we wanna do is we're ready. Our data is now sorted. It is ready to be brought over. We're gonna look at, if we look, what columns do we want it brought over? We want it brought over starting in column D all the way through column K. So we're gonna go change this to D and not M, but we're gonna change this to K. And where is it coming from? It's coming from columns Q through X. So we just need to make the updates here. Q, oops, there we go, through X, and then changing it there. Okay, very good. So now we're gonna select F2, that is the filtering, and then we're gonna turn on application screen updating. So now when we go into the transactions and we clear that filter, automatically that data will come in, perfect. If I want to add in a filter to make sure it's working, and we see that the rents. 
Very, very good. So we see how it doesn't take very long to make the updates. Let's take a look at D, delete. That's the last macro. And that is the macro that's also tied to this. So again, when I select on this, we tied it to that delete button. It's going to ask us if we want to delete the transaction. So we're going to take a quick look at that. Now we know when we select on something, we know what row we're deleting or clearing out because it is located in B4. So we're going to take a look. We want to make sure to give the user an opportunity to get out. So the first thing we're going to do is say, are you sure you want to delete this transaction? Notice the words already been updated in yes, no. If it is no, we're going to exit the sub. If transaction B4 equals empty, that means we have no database row, we can exit out. Once we determine we do have a database row, we're gonna put it into a variable called transaction row. Then we're gonna run a loop. In fact, I'm gonna change this to eight. The reason is I'm gonna go to eight. Now we could delete an entire row and that's fine too. However, in this instance, in this application, we are using sharing and sync. Now sharing and sync is the ability to share all of your data. Now one of the caveats of doing that is we can on our original database, we can only change one cell at a time. And the reason is I don't wanna delete an entire row because I do not wanna have any blank, fully blank rows. And I wanna make sure that when we change one cell at a time, those changes are going to be sent to other users. I've got entire training on that. Check with our co-authoring if you want to learn how to do that. I've gone into a lot of detail on how to share and seek. Now that functionality is already inside this application. We may not have a chance to go over it, but I do have a full training on that. But just so you know, this application is fully share and sync ready. So because it is, I'm going to not delete the row. I'm going to clear out from columns to all the way to column eight, clearing out the data. And so to do that, what we want to do is run a loop from two to eight, including the row. We're gonna take the transaction database, transfer row, column, clear the contents. We are going to also clear the contents of B3 and B4 and refresh the list. Very, very simple. So what would that look like? If I want to delete this transaction, let's say monthly salary here, and we'll pull it up here. We see it's this one right here, and I want to delete it. All I would need to do is just click delete. Yes, I want to delete it. What that's going to do is clear it out. And you see now we go skip from one to three. If we take a look inside our transaction database, we see that transaction ID two is still here, which is exactly what we want, but everything else has been cleared out. The reason that this does not show up here is because we have transaction name does not equal blank. If the transaction equals blank, we are not going to list it here. So that's why it's important. And notice that it is gone and everything else. Perfect, so that's all we have to do. So we just went through all the macros that we associated. Now these are the exact same macros except for the names and a few of the columns, right? We've just updated a few of the columns, but everything else, uh, let's take a look at the user macros, vendor macros, customer macros, they're all exactly the same. Employee macros, everything is exactly the same. Pretty, pretty easy. So, so that's how you can easily create this transaction management or any type of database using that list. Then what you'll wanna do is two things when you have your list. You're gonna go ahead and hide these columns and then what we're gonna do is we don't want people to see the row. So we're, again, we're going to set that with a custom format. So we're gonna go into general, we're gonna change that and we're gonna to go to a custom format. And in this case, I've got the word row and I've got the row. So I'm gonna use three semicolons. That is going to hide it. We are now absolutely ready. All we would need to do is lock it down and we are ready, good to go. So that's all we have to do. Okay, very good. What would you like to get into next? How about we go in, we see how we created this very, very cool. I've got, of course, I've got an entire training on this, but I can go over relatively quickly with you. The first thing that you'll need is this Office Ribbon Toolbar. Now this is a free application, right? I've included it with my toolbar training. You can also search on the internet. It's free to download Office Ribbon X Editor free. Now, what we're gonna do is I've created a bunch of icons. And to do that, what you'll do is you'll just open up your workbook, whatever workbook you have, whatever it is, this is our mentorship work, training we did that and so i've got this and so i'll just open up the workbook it's already open here but we'll do that so let's uh let's start from the beginning i'm going to close this out just as you would so when you get it it's going to look something like this all you would do is then just open your workbook and you just browse for the workbook that you're working on and we're working on this the ultimate erp and we're going to open it up once we open it up it's going to load and you'll have nothing in your workbook but what you can do is you can simply copy my xml code here and you can also then modify it. And it's very simple. This is kind of a simple toolbar. I've, I've got one that's more complex, but this will get it done. So what I want to do is I've created additional groups. Let's go ahead and drop this down and we're gonna pin it so that we can take a look at it 
while we are checking it out okay so we're going to go in here now i also want to go inside here the toolbar i've got a module for the macros that are going to help us with that so having those things open we can now see inside our ribbon editor we've got some html code so this is always going to be the same now if it's blank let's just copy this and then i'm going to clear it out if it's blank like yours would be and you want to start from scratch you can do this you can insert sample and then we would use custom tab so i basically started i basically started with this and then i just kind of copied some groups so we have a tab name we have a custom tab it's called ultimate erp so we've got a custom tab you have a group a unique group id so that's basically what i started with so let me just paste back what in i have when you clear this out i'm going to paste because i already copied and pasted the clipboard so again so you see how i started and then i just kind of built it out so first of all i created a brand new tab id so this tab has a unique id it can be anything as long as it's unique from other tabs and i've given it a label here ultimate erp so then we have an initial group for our admin so we have a group so you see this group on the left it's called admin and users and i've created an id a unique id called admin button and user button i've given it a label admin and users an image now you see all these images how did i get the images if i want to insert icons i've got a bunch of icons here and i could just insert a bunch of icons so that's all i did if i want to insert more i just hold down the control and insert all the icons and click open and then they're already here so do you want to insert so i'm just going to put no okay so that's all you would do because my icons are already in the application so i'm just saying no i don't want duplicates so that's all you would need to do to get your icons inside once you've created it if you want my icons of course i'll make sure they're available on patreon okay so your image must be the exact name admin as whatever your image name is in here we'll set it to large and then also we have a macro now that's the macro that's going to run and it's called toolbar admin so each one of these is a macro so if we look inside our code here and we have our toolbar we also have a macro called toolbar admin now it's very important that it is a control as i ribbon control this is specific for your toolbar so anytime you create a toolbar macro you want to have something like control as i ribbon control then all we need to do is what do we want to happen i just want to activate the admin or i just want to activate the users or or i want to run a macro orders activate and then i want to run a macro for purchase orders or activate the order and then run a macro to uh, do the invoices the reason i have two of those is because on invoices i've got a tab and select on that and then that's going to select our invoices so notice that we have invoices it's going to add a new one so that's going to activate however if we do purchase orders it's going to keep the same screen we don't need to enter at least one we don't need to save that it's going to do the same thing except this time we've selected purchase orders so that's why in these two we have activate the screen and we want to run a macro to order i'll go quickly over those macros in a moment so basically all we need to do is have a macro name and then the rest are just simply to activate whatever sheet that's all we it's a very simple macro so each one of those macros inside our xml code are tied here it's called on action that is what do we want to happen when the user clicks it and that way when i click users it goes to the users when i click employees it goes to employees payroll and so on and so forth okay this payroll has a brand new training of course that i just came out with a few months ago or like six eight weeks ago so i've got a training on that okay so that's all we have to do for the toolbar so each individual one let's go back into the xml code each individual one has our button it has a label it has an image a size and then of course the macro that's associated with it so we've got our order management which is for both invoice and purchases we have our employee manager so each one are these individual groups so this makes up a group and that's how we get this group these individual groups on here so notice that we have our order management group we have our employee management group we have our customers and vendors our products and transactions and reports and dashboards now if you want this and sign to appear it's a little bit tricky to use the and sign inside those you'll need to use something like and amp semicolon and amp semicolon so this right here is the and sign you can't just write an and sign it won't show up so if you want an and sign you'll need to use this and amp semicolon and amp semicolon so that's why so here's our individual group here's the buttons in the group again each one has a label each one has an image the size 
and the macro. So very, very simple. That's all you need to do for that. The only thing that, that you want to make sure is if, if the workbook is open, like it is now, and I try to click save, it's not going to allow me because the workbook is open. So it's going to give me an error. It's going to say this process cannot access the file. So the only important thing is you can make all the changes you want. But when you want to save it, you'll have to save your workbook, of course, any changes, close your workbook, then you will go in and you will save the changes, right? Because basically the workbook is open here and it's open here, so we can't save it. So make sure before you save changes here, you close the work, save the workbook, then save it here, then you can open it back up and those changes would take effect. So that's all we have to do. Again, I have an entire training on custom toolbar, but I did want to go over that with you. Okay, very good. I'm going to go over briefly again on the invoices and purchase, then we're going to get to the dashboard and then we're going to be good to go. So the invoice and purchase now again i'm not going to go over every detail because i have entire trainings on how to create invoices but i do want to go over this unique tab feature which is very very cool and very very unique to this particular training and that's why i wanted to go over it so the idea is this purchase orders and invoices are very very similar so why not make them the same screen and that's exactly what i've done here so we've also got some hidden columns and i'm going to unhide those here and so we've got some very very unique training let's move that over here so how do we do that so we've got some information here whether we're loading an invoice this is important because if i'm loading i need to know if, for example if i ch make a change and i add an item that information needs to automatically update based on that so i have to know whether we're loading i have to know what type we're on is it an order type purchase or is it an invoice this will change this icon can move over here so that's also important we need to understand that I want to know what the ID of the order is, what the database row, what is the next available one, the selected order type. I want to know if it's selected purchase and I want a search order row. That's going to be based on the search order right here. And I want to know the selected order row here. That's the selected. So you use conditional formatting. Notice we selected row 15 and I want to know the customer vendor database row. So basically if I've selected a vendor here, it is going to be a vendor. Now keep this in mind that if we are on invoice orders and we, you'll see that it is now a customer. So this has been changed. So basically everything is based on what is in B2. When I select the tab, it saves the current one and it, it does add new. So that's kind of important. So keep that in mind. I'm going to get rid of this. I, I don't think we need to select this. So what it's doing is selecting this and it's moving it over here, selecting Q. I really don't need that. I'll select something else, probably K6 on add new. I think that's a good idea. We're going to make that update in a moment. So what I want to do is I want to know that selected customer vendor. So to make sure if we have one, that customer here, I want to know the row associated with that. And I've got named ranges, some named ranges, one for customer name, and I've got one for vendor name. So basically, we're going to look to B2. B2 is going to either be invoice or it's going to be purchased based on the selected tab. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to run a match based on K6. And if it's an invoice, we're looking for a customer. If it's a purchase, we're looking for a vendor. So we can use the same cell and it's going to return the database row that that customer or vendor was located on. And that's important because when I decide to load the street and I want to load the address information, I need to know what row it's on. Okay, very good. So we kind of understand a good amount of this. Now let's take a look at this really cool tab feature and how does that happen? I want to go into the macro. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click here. We're going to assign the macro. And we see that it's called order tab PO, purchase order. So we're going to edit that. And what that's going to do is going to take us into this module called order macros, order macros. We're going to start at the top, order tab invoice. And that means that is when it's selected. When I select invoice orders, I want something to happen. This tab, this little shape here, I just created this shape and I put it right above there. So what I want to do is I want a few things to happen. One, I want the color to change. And two, I want to make sure, of course, I want the font color to change. And I want to load all the invoices that are associated with the recent invoices and a few other things. We're going to get into each one. So the first thing, this is called invoice tab. The name of this shape here is called invoice tab, as we can see right here. So we see that. Now, the first thing what I want to do is I want to change it to that light blue background. So focusing on this shape, fill for color we're going to set the rgb to 198 229 and 243. how do we know those colors if i right click this shape let's get out of here i'm going to escape out of here okay then we're going to go in here i'm going to go into the actually format the shape and we're going to go into the fill and we're going to go into more fill colors 
and we see that 198, 229, and 243. So we're going to grab that those colors directly from the RGB values here, and we are going to place them directly inside VBA here. So once you have a color here, the RGB 198, 229, 243, this is the font color. Let's take a look at this. So the font color, font color is dark blue, font color dark blue blue okay so the text frame text range font fill four colors so this is the font color we are also going to give it a very specific color based on that so i want that selected so if we see the text fill and we go into the more colors we see 47 85 151 47 85 151 which is the same one here 47 85 151 so that's that dark blue font okay but what about the other tab that's the po tab i also want to give that a color which is our unselected color which is the white font and that whoops i selected it so we can see regardless of what we select we are automatically going to change it to that dark blue let's select it again so that dark blue again i want to use that dark blue as a background and the white font this is for our purchase so to do that focusing on that po tab this time we're going to give it that dark blue background so the same color but this time we're going to use that color as a background that background and the text is going to give it that white font white font is rgb 255 255 25 that's the white font so that's how we get the look but then what i want to do is i want to change b2 to invoice that's going to say then what i want to do is i want to know if b4 does not equal empty if we have a selected then i want to do order save and update and basically what that means is if i've selected an order i want to make sure that if there's any changes we're going to update that so it doesn't keep moving out to the right that means if b4 there's an active invoice or active purchase order i want to make sure that we're saving it just in case because i don't want to clear it out if the user has not saved it i want to make sure to save it for them so we're going going to save it we're going to update the customer name validation i want to delete it i want to make sure that this data validation here looking k4 if we see that let's select it again make sure that we have the data validation here i want to make sure that we've updated it to the customers or inside the purchase orders to the customers so how do we do that well if we take a look inside the data validation we see we have a list of customers here or otherwise if we select purchase orders we need to make sure that we have an updated validation for the purchase orders here so we have our our vendor list here so this data validation is going to change based on that if we go into the data validation we see that this is vendor names right which is based on our vendor names however if we select on invoice orders i want to make sure that our updated list is based on the customer names if we look in the data validation now we see that it says customer names which is based on our customer names so how do we do that well if they've selected invoice i want to make sure that we have a list of customer names so to do that whatever data validations in k6 we're going to delete it and then we're simply going to add a data validation for our customer name we are then going to list the orders which is going to basically run a macro that lists all the associated orders for whether it's invoices or purchase orders i'll go over that in a moment to see that and then we're going to run add new i want to add new basically i want to clear it out because of whatever's here i want to make sure we clear it out and add new so it's going to either be new invoice or new purchase order so when i select on a tab it's going to go to new purchase order so we don't need to save that and it's going to go to new purchase order so that's all we really need to do very very easily continuing on so the po is exactly the same the only difference is we're updating it to a vendor name right the po and we're making it a purchase so orders list that means the, the macro that loads the orders is the same regardless of his purchase orders or invoices and how can we do that well if we see the order list the original data where that data is coming from all we need to do is run an advanced filter based on the order type meaning we only want to list invoices or i only want to list purchase orders so we have to have criteria based on that and that criteria is going to come right from here if we see that order type is based now this of course is based on b2 and that means if b2 changes to invoices it's going to show invoices so here's our criteria and here's our results so that's the simple advanced filter to go all the way down and then those results are going to come right here and that is in the order list that's the macro that we're going to go over next so the first thing what we want to do inside this macro is clear out all the associate names so i want to clear out from d6 
all the way through H and all the way down. I want to clear everything out. And I also want to clear out all this, the selected row, which is located in B8. I want to know that selected row, we're going to clear that out. So we're clearing out B8 and we're clearing out all the data from D6 through H99. Now we're going to focus on the orders database. That's the database that we were focusing on here. Again, I'm going to run an advanced filter. We're going to determine the last row of this data. The criteria is M2 through M3. The results are going to come O2 through S2. So that's what we're going to do. Determine the last row. If there's less than four, that means we have no data. We're going to run our advanced filter from A3 through column H. Our criteria is going to be M2 through M3, and the results are going to be O2 through S2. So we're bringing that information. Determining the last results row. If it's less than three, that means we have no invoices or we have no purchase orders. Then if we have a single value, we don't need to sort, but I would like to sort the data, and I would like to sort it based on the order date. And I want the most recent order dates at the top, and I want the oldest at the bottom. So the most recent created purchase order or invoice will appear at the top. To do that, we're going to run the sort. It's going to be based on P3, which is our order date. We want it descending, meaning the newest dates on the top and the oldest dates on the bottom. Our range is going to be 03 all the way through S and the last results row. We're going to apply the sort. Once all the data is sorted, we could then bring it into our sheet, D6 through H and the last results row plus three. Our row here starts on row six. Our, our original row is three, so we need to compensate that for three additional rows. So we're simply bringing over the data, and that's it. I also want to set any selected row, although that probably is not necessary because we're going to add it. But in case there's already a order that's selected, then I want that order row to appear directly inside B8, whatever's been selected. Whatever order is available in B3, meaning if we have already an order located here and that order is found here, I want it automatically selected. So that means if we add it, so also and then Q5, I'm going to unselect that. I don't want it moving over there. So that's pretty much it. That's all we have to do. Order add new. This is Q K6. This is what I'm going to select. Okay, so great. That's all we need to do. Relatively easy. When we're adding a new order, we're simply clearing a bunch of fields. If it's an invoice order, I want to set the default sales income. Now we have default accounts. This is going to get into a little bit of accounting. Because we have full accounting on this, we also want to set the default account. If we're making a purchase, what is the expense account? If we're selling it, what is the purchase account? If, if it's an invoice, let's clear that out. If it's an invoice, I want to know what is the sales account. So we have inside our list here, we've got here a list of accounts, and I want to know what accounts are associated. So I've got some default accounts for our invoice sales, invoice, let's pull it up right here, materials purchased for our purchase orders and for our sales, invoice sales, so that we know exactly what. So it's going to come either from S19. If it's an invoice, I want to know what account is going to be related to when we're selling items and what account, expense account, when we purchase items. So that's going to be here in S21. So that's kind of important to add those. And we also want to know the default invoice status when we have a new invoice, what is the default status? So that default status is going to be ordered for invoices and it's going to be for pending for purchase orders. So those defaults are going to come right here, ordered and pending. All right, very good. So I'm glad we got that. So orders are relatively simple. When we make a change on a product, that description information, we don't need to necessarily need to go into this because these are things that I've gone over much more detail on very specific invoice training. But that is it. Save, update, new order, print order, and delete order. All very, very similar. Okay, very good. Now, lastly, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get inside the dashboard and give you some uh, overview on how we created this incredible dashboard. The idea of this dashboard is to give a user a good snapshot of the company health. It covers sales, purchases, payroll, other income, other expenses, cost of goods sold, and a host of other things that are incorporated within this application. So how did we arrive at all this? Well, let's go ahead and start in the upper left. Now what we have is that we have a sales. Now all I did is create and group a shape. So I've got a single icon here that I've entered, and I've got some text boxes here. Now these text boxes are linked to a sheet, which is our chart data. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look inside our chart data. So all I did was simply insert shapes, text box, if we were to enter it here, and then we're gonna link it to the chart data. So if I put equals in here, and we go into a chart data, and this is where all of our chart data is located. So if I want information, let's say I want 
the 2023 sales and I would just click here and that's automatically. And then of course we would then just format that accordingly. So that's how I arrived at all this information, simply an icon and then linked data. So let's take a look at some of this data. The first switch is the 2023 sales. Now this is dynamic, meaning that when the year changes, so does the values and the text. So let's take a look inside this chart data. And all the information that we're going to focus on at the moment is right here. So the first thing I want is current year sales. Inside the dashboard, we have 2023 and we also have the current month. So I want the current year and I want the current month sales at my fingertips. We can do that here. So the first thing is we want a label. We want a dynamic label because when the year changes, I also want this to change. So to get that, we can use year of today, so the current year, and a space, and then sales. And so what we're doing is we're simply taking the current date, which is today, and we're extracting the year from it, which is gonna give us 2023 when this is recorded. So that's all we have to do, then a space and sales. But I also want to know the total sales for that. Now, if we take a look inside, we wanna know the amount. What is the amount of those sales? So inside our order list is where we want. So basically what I'm looking for is I'm looking for all the order totals, but only for those items, which is an invoice. Now we have a table that we've created called orders. So if I have a table that's green, trade orders, and if you want to do that, of course, control T here, and we would just do table design, but we've already created a table called orders for this. So basically all I need to do is use a sum ifs, and I wanna know all the order totals of invoices, but I only want to know them on the current year. So we're going to use some ifs for that. So let's take a look back inside the chart data and take a look at this formula. Again, we're going to use some ifs and I want to use based on the orders and the order total. Now I often use named ranges, but this time we're using tables. And to get that, all we need to do is just type in orders here. Then we're going to use a bracket here and then we're going to determine the total so we're looking for the total so we just find here and it's that order total right here that is what our sum is so we just select that and then we close the bracket here that's what our sum is now we also want to know that our first criteria range again we only want to focus on the order type those of which are invoice so those are the only ones and of course only those orders which have an order date of greater than or equal the first of the year or less than or equal the last date of the year. So to do that, we're gonna use our criteria range is that order date, order's date here. Then what we want to do is we wanna make sure that we have greater than or equals and we wanna know the first day of the year. So again, we're gonna use the year of the current day. So today is the current date. We're gonna extract the year from that, which is 2023. I want January, which is the first month, and I want the first day, which is here. So this is greater than or equal January 1st of the current year. And I also want it less than or equal the last day of the year. So it's gonna be based on, again, our criteria, it's the order's date, less than or equal the last day of the year. Again, taking the current year, this time the month is December and the last day. So using all that, we are going to get our amount of 44,000 743, which is all the total sales. Now what I want to know is I only want to know the month sales. So the first thing is I want a label. So if we take a look inside this cell, it's P6. If we look in our dashboard and we see that our label is connected to P6 and the data value is connected to P7. So to get that, we're going to go here. So again, this time I want the current month. So that month of October, right now it's October. When the month changes, so will that. So to do that, what I want to do is I'm going to use the today once again. But this time, I want to use the text of the today, the current day. And I want to use, so this is a date here, but I only want to format that date and I only want to see the months. So only the months. And to do that, we're going to use four M's. That is going to give us the text. So that text here is the month name and the space and sales. So that's exactly how we're going to get it month of October. Now, to get the amount, we're going to use something very similar, except we're going to change the dates. Once again, we're going to use some ifs, and we want to know the orders total. I want to know the total of all those orders. Again, only those which are invoices. And only those, this time, these are based on the first day of the current month until the last day of the current month. So we're going to use greater than 
or E equals, the date, we're going to use the current year. This time I want to use the current month number and one, meaning the first. So this right here will get us the first day of the month. Now, I also want it to be less than or equal the last day of the month. And to use the last day of the month, we can use EO month, EO month. Once again, we're going to extract the first day of the month here. This is the first day. But since it's wrapped in EO month, otherwise known as end of month, and I want zero months ahead, zero months back, so we're just gonna use zero. This is gonna get us the last day of the month. So this is gonna tell us the total order sales for invoices on the current month, which is 16,800. Okay, very good. Now for purchases, again, now I wanna know the 2023 purchases or the October purchases. And that's again, very, very simple here because all I need to do is use exactly the same formulas this time. However, this one for the current year, we're simply going to change the order type to purchases and the rest of the formula is exactly the same. The same thing for the current month. Again, the same formulas I described, except this time, instead of invoice, we're using purchases. And that's gonna let us know the total month purchases. Okay, great. Now what I wanna do is I wanna focus on payroll. Now payroll takes up three Three sheets. This is our payroll. We're not going to get into detail again because I have a training just on this, but it works fantastic and it does all the payroll for all your employees, including uh, additions, deductions, uh, payroll, personal time off, and it's a really amazing training. Again, I got a training on that. Just type in payroll and search, or I'll, I'll try to include the link down below so you can see this original training. Also, so this includes employees, right? We have employee database here. We have a payroll database. So it's going to include this payroll. So we know the from date, the gross amount, and the net amount of the payroll. And then individual payroll items. So the individual payroll items are here. Item type, social security, you know, individual. So whether there's a deduction or whether it's an addition or whether it's a tax or a pay time off, all of that information is tracked here. Okay, so now that we understand that inside our payroll database, we're also going to use this. I've got a table already set up called payroll. So we want to know information about the pay date or the gross amount or the net amount. And the so that's going to help us here. So inside our dashboard, inside our chart data here, what I want to know is I want to know the total payroll for the current year. Once again, I'm using a custom label based on the current year. And this time we're using again, sum ifs, and I want to sum all the payroll gross amounts, gross amounts based on that. And I want to know it based on the pay date. Remember, these are inside the payroll. Now that pay date has to be greater than or equal the first of the year and less than or equal the last date of the year. And that is going to get us our total payroll information. Very good. So that's going to be our total payroll. So relatively easy as we see inside that. And of course, that is connected directly to here. So we have our chart data connected to P18. We have our payroll total, that formula that I just went over to P19. And that's going to come directly into here. So it's going to go directly into P19. What about other year income? Now let's going to take a look and switch our focus to transactions. So we have transactions here, which you saw, and then we have a transaction database here. So if we take a look inside this table, we see that we have a table called transactions. And of course we have individual, we have a transaction date, we have a transaction amount, we have a account type, whether it's expense, cost of goods sold, or income. So we have three different account types. So when we go into, let's go back here, we've got so many sheets on this. We go into a chart data, I really wanna focus on only those income. So to do that, we are going to use, again, some ifs, but we're gonna focus on our income. We're focused on the transaction amounts of that table. And I wanna focus on the transaction account type, only those for the income. And again, the transaction date this time is greater than or equal the first day of the year, less than or equal the last day of the year. That is gonna determine all the income. We're gonna do exactly the same for expenses, except this time based on the same table, the same amount. This time we're gonna focus on expenses. And lastly, cost of goods sold. I wanna know the total cost of goods sold. So all three of those individual types directly from our transactions database here, whether they're expenses or cost of goods sold 
or income are going to get added up based on the current year. So it's going to be very, very helpful that we can have those totals using tables in this case and also using the sum. And it's all going to be summed here in the chart data. So that's how I get all that information here. And again, I just added some white icons here and I used a little bit of a group. If we were to take these out, we can see there's a little bit of a fade here on a shape. So that's going to kind of give us that look and feel. And it's relatively easy, just kind of takes a little bit of work. So I put those all up in the top. And of course, Course, these are all in base if we look in here and we show our headings we can see that all those have been added to row two and row two just has a background color of a blue so i didn't use the shape i just used the background of the row color very good so we can hide our headings now what i'd like to do is i'd like to know a profit summary now to get this look you see how we've got some information but i've got them in cells so what i did is i actually put this shape over so this is just a shape over to give it a nice look and feel but it's actually over so if we move this we can get some information now i want to know a profit summary for the current year now we have some similar formulas which we're going to take a look at i want to know all of the invoice sales income all the invoice sales so we saw this previously right up here totals so we're going to use the same but i want to know for the total year so again we're going to use a sum of total based on invoice greater than the first of the year so this 44,000 is going to be exactly the same as this number right here. We're going to use the formula in here. I also want to know other income. Now, other income we have here. So let's, so sometimes when you relink it, we can see how it goes back. So all we need to do is just update it to the current, which I believe is 16 here, and then changing the font to white here, and then changing it to bold. Okay, great. Actually, I think it was 14 on that. So looks like it was 14. So that's all we have to do just to format those. Notice when you relink it, it's going to be changed back. Very good. Next up, other income, just as we did before, 47,305. This is the same formula as here, which we went over, which is similar. So all we're doing is we're taking the same formulas and we're bringing them in a little bit of a profit and loss summary. If I want to know the total gross income, it's simply the invoice sales times any other income that you have through the transaction. Now, to get the other income, if we wanna, how do we add that other income? Well, that's gonna be through transactions. So when we add a new transaction, we can add any. So if we have an income, let's say we have uh, rental income. So these are income accounts here. So that's how we would add the other income. And that's how the information, these other income gets inside this database here. So what I wanna do is I wanna add all of those other incomes up and that's going to happen inside our dashboard here. So total gross income, again, is simply the total income sales times invoice sales. And then next up, I want the period payroll. How do we, add, again, we're going to add the payroll as we remember correctly. 2023 payroll, we have it here. It's the same number here. Certainly we could link it. We just put in the formula one more time. We went over that formula again. I want to know the total purchases. So this is based on those total purchases, just as we did up here. Now we're going to put it here and I want to know the cost of goods sold. So these are going to be the cost of goods sold based on that same formula. What I want to do then is determine the gross profit. Now the gross profit is simply our total income minus our combined payroll purchases and cost of goods sold. So we would do that here. It's simply H7 minus H8 minus H9 minus H10 or minus the sum of these. It's the same thing. And that's all we do to get that. So that's how we get that 37. Then what we want to do is determine the other expenses. Again, other expenses, just as we had here, 23,600. It is the same here. It's been rounded up there. So 23, 5, 9, 50, we could round these up, but I kept these decimals. We have a little more space here. And then we have our net profit, which is simply our gross profit minus our other expenses to get our net profit. That's it. So that's all we have to do. And then we're just going to place this nice little shape above here to give it a good look and feel. Okay, very good. How do we get the rest of this information? Well, we're going to use pivot tables for the rest. If we take a look in chart data, for example, let's say we have these monthly sales. Now we know that these monthly sales here are coming from our invoices. So if we were to go into our order list here and we wanted to create a pivot chart to do just that we would do insert then pivot charts here and i'm going to use an existing worksheet and we're going to select over here into chart data and we'll just select down here and then click insert so what do we want to have in here well of course i want to show the monthly sales by month and then the total income so inside our date we're going to put the order date in here 
Okay, now, of course, I only want to show the months, so we want to get rid of date and the date, so we can do that, simply remove the field, and then the date, we can remove that field. I want to show the values, so we're going to go into the order total and put that into the values. Then, of course, I only want to show not purchases, but only invoices. So the order type is going to go into the filters. Inside here, we're going to select on invoice only. So now that we have all the data and it matches what we have up here, I then want to make sure that we have the information that we need based on that. But of course, we need some date filters on that. So what are those date filters? So we're going to click on here and then I want to click on some date filters. And I want to click on the current year, right? It's only for that. So how do we do that? Let's scroll up here so we can see everything that we need. We're going to click on here, the row numbers. We're going to click on date filters here. Sorry, it's a little bit off the screen. And I want to click the current year. So this year is the one I want to focus on this year. So now we have the current information and we want to create a chart for that. So we're going to use as we did in the line. We're going to use a line here in the dashboard. We use the monthly sales of the line. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're simply going to insert. This time I want to check a line graph. So we can align and then we have a line graph here. So it's very similar to what we have. We're going to expand it here and we want it similar. So this one, as we see, it's called monthly sales. So that's what we want to focus on for the current year. We're going to go into the chart data. We're going to change this to monthly sales. So monthly sales. We don't need this information here. So we can right click here and just hide all fields of button and chart. We don't need the total here. We certainly don't need it here. If we want to change the legend, we can, but we just going to remove it for now. We don't need that. Also, these grid lines here, we can remove that. We can show those inside our dashboard. I chose to just show a few numbers if we want to because it's very small. We don't have a lot of space on that. So when we drop it down here, I would like all the font to change colors. So we're going to go into the format and all the text fill is going to be our blue color here. That's going to change it all. And we do want to show some data. So we're going to insert and add those data labels here. And we want to format those data labels, right? We want to format them as currency, but I don't want to show the sense. So we would select on here and we can do control one to show the values here. We can get rid of this for now. Inside there, we have a number here. So I'm going to format those as currency here. We can bring it over here. We can, so there we go. So now, but I do not want to show the decimal places. So we could just put zero and I would like to show them above. So we're going to click above. I want to show those formatting those accordingly. So if we want to format them all, I can do this and increase the font size probably to about 10 or 11 as we did before and then make them bold. So that's about what I did there. And then no background and no. So we can do control X if we want to match it out, put it in the dashboard. We can kind of get to see how we did it here. So whoops, let's not do that. Let's select on something other than that. Just here is fine. And now we can do going to paste that in there to get an idea of exactly how we reached that. Expanding that a little bit here, bringing it down here just so we can match what we have. There's no background or no fill, so we're going to format that. I'm going to put the shape fill as no fill. We also want no outline on that. And that's pretty close to what we have. It's a little bit this on top of each other now, but we can see exactly how we created this and I can delete that now. Also, we just have a custom background behind it. So here's that custom background that's behind it. If I moved it over, we can see what that is and it basically in this background here that I created, it's just a shape here. So if I were to insert this shape here and wanted to create a similar background, I would just enter a rounded corner shape and then I would give it a fill. This is a gradient fill. Now, if we take a look, it's already set to that gradient fill. If we take a look at it, we've chosen a blue color and this particular blue color has a transparency of 46 or let's say 50%. This one white color has a transparency of 62%. So that's how I was able to get this. And of course, no lines on that. So when you select line that we do not want any line on that. So that's how I got the background. And we just want to make sure to move it to the back. So when we select shape format, we want to make sure it's sent to the back. That's going to send it behind everything. And that's what we want. Okay, we can delete that. We're done working with that. So that's how we created this very cool background. We can just move that directly in back of the graph that we've created to give it a nice look and feel. Now, 
other data is also we don't need to create these pivot charts for every single since we now see we if we want to delete it i'm just going to select on here and press delete we're good to go we can remove it and we can remove that we don't need that so we have ones for gross payroll if we take a look at that we want to see what that looks like we can go into the pivot table and we can see in our field list and take a look at this one we've created a pivot chart this is directly from our payroll so we want the pay date again we're going to show the pay date i want to show the months again we can remove this the dates we can remove that and we don't need the date here so this is going to be for our payroll if we remove that what does that look like let's go ahead and take a look at the dashboard and we see we have gross payroll by month that's what we want again we did not format i didn't format these however i did format it once they're in the chart so simply selecting them closing this out using control one to display it and we're using the formatting i'm using this number formatting currency and zero to get that formatting everything else is formatted the same pretty much the same how we got that okay great let's take a quick look so we've been over those and i want to show you how we get these very cool donut charts we've got invoice by status and we have purchase order by status we've also added slicers so that we can remove the slicers if we want to and they're going to cover so this is kind of nice although i don't use slicers too much this data is kind of basic but it's it gives you an idea if you'd like to use slicers we can save a column for that to do that all right so these pie charts where does this data originate from well we see here excuse me these donut charts here inside this we've got here expenses by type here and we also have information here by this is actually should be income by type not expenses salary rent and freelance work these are all income i just didn't change it i copied and pasted it, but this is really income by type and how do we know that because we see the filter right above it here income these are should be expenses you could include cost of goods sold and expenses both of these i would like to do that so these are expenses basically based on uh, cost of goods sold and expenses this one's based on income so the filter is based only on those income so these are very much the same both of these will then break down the information based on the type so when we select a field list we see that the account types in the filter the transaction accounts in the rows and we have the sum of the amount so that's going to very easily total our expenses we can then create a bar chart just as we did before in the dashboard we can focus on these these are the bar type other expenses by type and income by type I'm going to focus on that inserting those bars we would just simply insert here and then we want the bars which are right here so this 2d bar chart and that's how we're going to get both of these expenses by type again removing this removing all the fields here we can update the total changing the font just as we did setting all the font to that blue color and then making the updates accordingly we would want to set here we want to set the data labels here which we have adding the data labels and then formatting that just as we did before we would remove all the fields here hide all the buttons on the chart we don't need that and this would be the expenses by type exactly as we have them right here just updating that and the other income by type exactly so these are the two bars now we can get into both the invoice status and the purchase order status moving along inside here so these two would come directly from here invoice by status and purchase orders so we have a very very similar we can remove this now we see how we created that here invoice by status again this one we're going to use the pivot chart here inside this we can take a look at the fields here we have order type right we only want to know in the order type the invoices so our filter is only those invoices we only want to know the invoices the status of those invoices so our rows are going to be status we're going to just want the count i only want to know the number we're only focused on the number of clothes or the number delivered ordered paid or pending so we want simply a count right i'm only counting those how to do that well we would just select here and we only want to know the count of those so the value filters here we, we don't have any filters on here however simply double clicking here will tell us the count so sometimes we use some this time we're using count count is all we need to do and i just want to count the totals this one of course into a donut chart if we want to create that we would insert a donut chart here selecting on the pie and donuts the one we want to use and we're not going to display we don't need to hide we can hide all the field buttons on the chart we don't want the legend we can delete that and select on that I want to change the colors we can easily change the colors here going to colors and changing that to a blue theme 
We also would do control one here. We want to add more information. In my one, I did not have any lines on that, so no lines. And I also put a shadow onto that, a slight shadow onto that. Not the, not the group itself here, but the actual individual one. So let's control Z. This is where we wanted it. So this is where we had our shadow. No lines on this. And then this one is where we would put our shadow presets here. And then we can reduce that a little bit. And also I put a little bit of a 3D format on that, which is right here. So the 3D format would be here. So we added, a, but not quite that much. So just a slight bevel on that. And that's basically, and also the data labels on that. Adding those data labels, simply right click in here and then adding those data labels. If you want to see the categories and we want to show that outside in, we could do that. Just by bringing them over here, we can bring them out and we may want to show the categories too. If we want to show the categories, we'd select on here and we would select on the label option and show those categories. And then of course, we would just format that. We want to give them all the same color and then we would just update that. So that's and also the donut hole size. We use a smaller size, so about right here. That gives you a good idea of exactly what we did to create the donut. Both the donut would be for the invoice by status and for the purchase order by status. That's where we arrived right here on both of these. Very, very cool. So we show you the bars. We've got the donut charts. We've got the bar charts. And lastly, I just wanted to show you the payroll items by type. We just use a simple pie chart for that inside the chart data here. And here we have our payroll items by type. So how do we get this? Again, one more with a pivot. If we go into the pivot table here, we go into the field list. We see based on our payroll table, we've got pay date. We're filtering. I want to know the payroll. Our dates are all dates. But we can filter down. We, maybe we want the current year. If we want to set all pay dates, we can easily filter it. And also the payroll items, we got deductions and additions. If we want to add a PTO and tax, we could. But I only want to. I only want to show those deductions and additions as payroll types. We may also want to filter by the date. So we can do that as well. These are going to show, and then we also want to know the sum. Again, I did not format these. However, I did format them here. So we created a pie chart. So they were formatted here inside the pie chart. To create the pie chart for this, we would just simply insert a pie chart here, a 2D pie chart here, and that's going to insert that. Okay, and then we would format it exactly the same, right? The formatting of the donut, it's almost the same. So we've been over how to format that. So pretty much adding the labels and doing, we don't need to repeat the process again and again. But that gives us a great idea of how we were able to create this incredible dashboard. Well, this has been a really, really incredible training because in this incredible ultimate ERP application, we were able to show you how you can create applications very fast by using uniformity and quick VBA code simply by copying and pasting and replacing the code. And we did the same thing, that same principles, whether we're for employees or for customers or anything else. Let's go ahead and hide these columns. We don't need to see the columns because you know that they're there. So we use that same. We were able to show you how we could edit records, delete records, add, it, add new records, filter for any type of a record, whether that included customers, vendors, employees, users, or anything else very, very easily. So make sure you grab this template. We also showed you how to create this really cool custom ribbon toolbar and a really cool dashboard in a fantastic ERP. I hope you like this training and of course template. Just let me know your suggestions, your ideas in the comments below. I answer each and every one of them. If you want to learn how to create incredible applications, designing, defining, deploying your own Excel-based applications while I create an incredible accounting application, I'm doing that in my mentorship courses. It is a fantastic 132-hour deep dive into how to create these incredible applications so that you can sell them for passive income or create or start your freelance career. And that is through the mentorship program. I'll include the link down below. Thank you so much for your continued support right here on this channel. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment below. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.